What do you picture when you hear the word hipster? They are probably wearing tight jeans, a flannel, beanie, black frame glasses, maybe a beard. And of course, the stereotypical hipster is holding a can of PBR. But wait, why PBR? There's no real definition of a contemporary hipster, but some generally agreed upon descriptive terms include anti-mainstream and anti-consumerism. Oh, come on, guy like that hanging out here? Bar's over. In his 2011 book, Hipstermatic, author Matt Granfield summed up hipster culture by writing, Above all, they wanted to be recognized for being different, to diverge from the mainstream and carve a cultural niche all for themselves. This is the story of how PBR tapped into the hipster consumer. The Pabst Blue Ribbon Can is a classic. It's decorated with clean red lines, ornate font, an artistic hop necklace, and of course, the iconic Blue Ribbon logo. It's an ode to Pap's early practice of tying ribbons on each bottle to symbolize its award-winning taste. To this day, you'll see America's Best in 1893 printed on every can. Sales peaked in 1977 at 18 million barrels. To put that into perspective, the number one brand Budweiser sold 26 million barrels in 1976. But by the turn of the century, PBR was far from their glory days. In 2001, they recorded selling under 1 million barrels. The company really at that time was very accustomed to declining volume. There was not a, a culture of winning. That's Neil Stewart. When he took the job as senior brands manager of Pabst Blue Ribbon in 2000, he was charged with reversing a 20-year sales decline. When I started, the, the company was very focused on the consumer that you would have just kind of thought was into cheap beer, which was like retirees, older guys that are spending their days out on a fishing boat. Stewart not only looked at PBR marketing, but the state of the beer industry. Back then, a lot of premium light brands were still using girls in bikinis for their advertising. A lot of larger brands were using kind of cheap humor for their advertising. PBR's target demographic wasn't buying the product, and the younger generations were not buying into the advertising. But there was one place where Pabst was selling. Portland, Oregon. Our distributor in Portland, Oregon was like, yeah, this brand's on fire. Literally, there was a time, probably in 2001 or 2002, where their volume was doubling every month. Stewart flew out to see why. What I found was it kind of validated what we thought, that it was a consumer who was really rejecting traditional marketing tactics, and they had really adopted it as their brand. But it was a variety of different subcultures. So it was people that were into rockabilly. It was people that were into indie rock. It was bike messengers. It was people that were into Vespa scooter rallies. While walking bar to bar, talking to these new PBR drinkers, Stewart noticed they liked it for three reasons. One, it was retro. Two, it was cheap. Three, it wasn't flashy. Despite its blue ribbon, the taste probably wasn't a reason. BeerAdvocate.com scores Paps a lowly 2.93 out of five points. Stewart left Portland with his new target consumer. Anti-corporate, anti-marketing, nostalgia-loving members of subcultures living in specific urban centers. He didn't know it at the time, but his target consumer was the hipster. Paps then implemented a geographic strategy. It worked in Portland, so next up was Seattle, San Francisco, and Denver. In each city, the strategy was very grassroots. Instead of launching a message you hope will appeal to many people, you target your efforts to a small group and hope the group will spread your message to a much larger audience. Because remember, this new consumer did not want to be advertised to. One time, 
I was in San Francisco and San Francisco has a lot of bike messengers and we knew that bike messengers love PBR. So, you know, I kind of looked the part. I went into a bar, I had a, a bike messenger bag and it was full of PBR swag. And I went in there and I, I introduced myself to the bartender. I told him, I was like, don't tell him who I am. I, I gave him my, my card. I was like, don't tell him I work for Pabst. And of course he did exactly what I wanted him to do, which was tell everyone that I worked for Pabst. For the rest of the night, I had tons of people coming up to me and like introducing themselves, asking for swag. This grassroots campaign hopped from city to city, purposely targeting small groups of subcultures. In each city, Stewart and his team attended subcultural events like indie music festivals, facial hair clubs, and amateur sports games to spread PBR's reach through word of mouth. The strategy was as grassroots as it gets, and it was more successful than anyone could have predicted. In 2003, sales rose 15%. Each year that followed saw similar growth, and in 2009, sales jumped by 25%. Let's remember PBR sold less than 1 million gallons of beer in 2000. In 2012, PBR sold 92 million gallons. Businessman Dean Metropolis bought Paps Brewing Company for $250 million in 2010. He then turned quite a profit when he sold it to San Francisco-based private equity firm TSG Consumer Partners for $700 million in 2014. In recent years, PBR's growth has plateaued. The rise of craft beer started stealing more and more of the market share. But maybe the biggest detriment to PBR's success was exactly that, their success. PBR became popular. PBR became mainstream. In doing so, they may have turned away their biggest buyer, hipsters. Please leave your comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe.